Now open your question paper and look at part one. You'll hear people talking in eight different situations. For questions one to eight, choose the best answer A, B, or C. One, you overhear a young man talking about his first job. How did he feel in his first job? A. Bored. B. Confused. C. Enthusiastic. I didn't want to go to university, so when I finished school, I went and got a job. My parents said if I was in full-time education, they'd give me an allowance, but if not, I'd have to work. So I got a job in a big store in the menswear department. Actually, I think I had to go out and find out what I could do because in school I wasn't particularly brilliant. So when it came to doing work, I think I had to prove a lot of people wrong. So I really felt like doing it, even though it was just selling socks in Harridges. I didn't want to go to university, so when I finished school, I went and got a job. My parents said if I was in full-time education, they'd give me an allowance, but if not, I'd have to work. So I got a job in a big store in the menswear department. Actually, I think I had to go out and find out what I could do because in school I wasn't particularly brilliant. So when it came to doing work, I think I had to prove a lot of people wrong. So I really felt like doing it, even though it was just selling socks in Harridges. Two, you hear a radio announcement about a dance company. What are listeners being invited to? A, a show. B, a talk. C, a party. The Hilton Dance Company have been at the Camden Theatre for almost a month now. Offering us a wonderful program of mainly modern dances, the company have just celebrated their twentieth year of performances all over the world. But this week they'll be taking a break from dancing to give us an idea of how a dance company works. Top dancer and company manager Lisa West will be in the theater telling us about the company's work. But all the dancers will be there too, so it's also your opportunity for a get together. And of course, you don't need to have any experience of dance for this. The Hilton Dance Company have been at the Camden Theatre for almost a month now, offering us a wonderful program of mainly modern dances. The company have just celebrated their twentieth year of performances all over the world. But this week, they'll be taking a break from dancing to give us an idea of how a dance company works. Top dancer and company manager Lisa West will be in the theater, telling us about the company's work. But all the dancers will be there too, so it's also your opportunity for a get together. And of course, you don't need to have any experience of dance for this. Three, you overhear a woman talking to a man about something that happened to her. Who was she? A, a pedestrian. B, a driver. C. A passenger. I tell you, we were dead lucky. He could have done some serious damage if we hadn't reacted so quickly. What did he do? Just shoot straight out without looking? Yeah, Claire yelled something at me, and I just slammed on the brakes. Did he stop? <laughs> You're joking. Just blasted his horn at us and carried on. Oh, and there was nobody behind you. No, fortunately. Otherwise, who knows what might have happened? Oh, you were lucky. That road's always busy. I tell you, we were dead lucky. He could have done some serious damage if we hadn't reacted so quickly. What did he do? Just shoot straight out without looking? Yeah, Claire yelled something at me, and I just slammed on the brakes. Did he stop? <laughs> You're joking. Just blasted his horn at us and carried on. Oh, and there was nobody behind you. No, fortunately. Otherwise, who knows what might have happened? Oh, you were lucky. That road's always busy. Four. You hear a woman talking on the radio about her work making wildlife films. What is her main point? A. Being in the right place at the right time is a matter of luck. B. More time is spent planning than actually filming. C. 
It's worthwhile spending time preparing. The research for a major wildlife TV series can take up to a year, followed by about two years filming with four or five camera teams around the world at any one time. Finding the right stories to film is only half the job. The other half is finding the right location and then going out to help the camera person film it. Well, this can be difficult. You have to make sure you're in the right place at the right time. So good planning is essential. We spend a lot of time on the phone beforehand getting advice from local experts. The research for a major wildlife TV series can take up to a year, followed by about two years filming with four or five camera teams around the world at any one time. Finding the right stories to film is only half the job. The other half is finding the right location and then going out to help the camera person film it. Well, this can be difficult. You have to make sure you're in the right place at the right time. So good planning is essential. We spend a lot of time on the phone beforehand getting advice from local experts. Five, you hear part of a travel program on the radio. Where is the speaker? A, outside a cafe. B, by the sea. C, on a lake. This is the most beautiful place I've ever visited. And believe me, in my career as a travel writer, I've seen some fabulous scenes. From the deck of this small sailing boat, I have a wonderful view out over a short expanse of sparkling blue water to the white houses of the village on the left, and then to the wooded hillsides behind, which climb up to the snow-covered mountain peaks surrounding this lovely valley. By the water's edge, people are sitting in the late evening sun, enjoying a leisurely meal of fresh fish. Caught in these waters only a few hours ago. <laughs> it's heaven. This is the most beautiful place I've ever visited. And believe me, in my career as a travel writer, I've seen some fabulous scenes. From the deck of this small sailing boat, I have a wonderful view out over a short expanse of sparkling blue water to the white houses of the village on the left and then to the wooded hillsides behind which climb up to the snow-covered mountain peaks surrounding this lovely valley. By the water's edge, people are sitting in the late evening sun, enjoying a leisurely meal of fresh fish, caught in these waters only a few hours ago. <laughs> it's heaven. 6. You overhear a woman talking about a table tennis table in a sports shop. What does she want the shop assistant to do about her table tennis table? A. Provide her with a new one. B. Have it put together for her. C. Give her the money back. Giving me my money back isn't the point. My son needs to practice for an important match, but at the moment his table is lying in bits on the floor. When I bought it, I was assured that it would only take a matter of moments to screw the different parts in place, but the instructions don't make sense. Since I paid so much for it, I think it's only fair to ask for some hands-on help from you in getting it into a usable state. My son is impatient for a game on his new table. Giving me my money back isn't the point. My son needs to practice for an important match, but at the moment his table is lying in bits on the floor. When I bought it, I was assured that it would only take a matter of moments to screw the different parts in place, but the instructions don't make sense. Since I paid so much for it, I think it's only fair to ask for some hands-on help from you in getting it into a usable state. My son is impatient for a game on his new table. 7. You hear part of an interview with a businesswoman. What is her business? A. Hiring out boats. B. Hiring out caravans. C. Building boats. Helen, was this business always a dream of yours? No, not really. It developed from what we used to do, build fishing boats. How long have you been in business? About eight years. First we built the marina, then we bought boats to rent out for cruising holidays. It's going well. How many boats do you have? During the summer, I bet you're pretty busy. 
Yes. People use them like caravans, really. They go up river for their holidays and then bring them back to the moorings here for us to prepare for the next client. Helen, was this business always a dream of yours? No, not really. It developed from what we used to do, build fishing boats. How long have you been in business? About eight years. First we built the marina, then we bought boats to rent out for cruising holidays. It's going well. How many boats do you have? During the summer, I bet you're pretty busy. Yes. People use them like caravans, really. They go up river for their holidays and then bring them back to the moorings here for us to prepare for the next client. 8. You hear a man talking on the radio. Who is talking? A. An actor. B. A journalist. C. A theatre-goer. This is a really delicious part. Plenty to get your teeth into, some very good speeches, a lot of change of mood. There's lots for the audience to identify with too, so it all goes to make my job more rewarding. The fact that this is a revival means I also have the challenge of putting my own stamp on a role. The original performance, by the man who created the part some twenty years ago, will still be in the mind of some members of the audience. I couldn't ask for more. This is a really delicious part. Plenty to get your teeth into, some very good speeches, a lot of change of mood. There's lots for the audience to identify with too, so it all goes to make my job more rewarding. The fact that this is a revival means I also have the challenge of putting my own stamp on a role. The original performance, by the man who created the part some twenty years ago, will still be in the mind of some members of the audience. I couldn't ask for more. That's the end of part one. Now turn to part two. You'll hear a radio interview with Mike Reynolds, whose hobby is exploring underground places such as caves. For questions 9 to 18, complete the sentences. You now have 45 seconds in which to look at part 2. In the studio with me today, I have Mike Reynolds, who's what is known as a caver. In other words, he spends long periods of time exploring underground caves for pleasure. And Mike's here to tell us all about this fascinating hobby and how to get started on it. So, Mike, why caves? Well, cavers actually explore any space that's underground, whether it's caves, old mines or tunnels. Oh, right. So, how big are these underground spaces? Oh, anything up to 80 kilometres long? Which means that in some cases, in order to reach the end, you've got to sleep, to set up camp inside the cave at some point, uh, usually where both space and fresh air are available. <laughs> no good if you're afraid of the dark. No. So where do you find the best caves? In terms of countries, the best places are, for example, Ireland, Australia and the Philippines. Here in the UK, various areas have the right sort of geology. Uh, my favourite is Wales, but you can find plenty of caves in northern England and in Scotland too. Mm. Caving involves a lot of physical exercise, doesn't it? That's right. In terms of physical activity, it's very similar to climbing, except they go up and we go down. <laughs> the conditions can be very different though. We often find ourselves facing very small gaps in the rock, which we have to crawl through on our hands and knees. So the right equipment is obviously very important. If I wanted to start out on a hobby like this, what would I need? 
Well, you need a hard hat, and it's important to get one that fits properly so that it doesn't keep falling over your eyes or feel too tight. And these can cost anything from £5 to £20. Pounds. Mm, that doesn't sound too much for starters. Oh, but then there's the lamp. You wear that in your head because it's very important to keep your hands free at all times. But it doesn't come with the hat, and it can cost anything up to £50 pounds to get a suitable one. Mm, I guess warm clothes are a must too. You'll need to spend thirty to forty pounds on a waterproof suit because the caves can be pretty wet and cold inside, and you can get ill if you're not protected. Then, of course, the thing that you really need to spend money on is something for your feet that keeps the water out. Strong boots are essential for this. Also, because without them, you could be slipping on wet surfaces and doing yourself an injury. Cheap ones are just not as safe, I'm afraid. Mm. Well, it sounds pretty tough. I mean, is it really only a sport for the young and fit? That's quite interesting because people tend to think that. But in fact, cavers come from all ages and backgrounds, students and professionals alike. You even find 80-year-olds who've been doing it for years. What exactly is it that people find so attractive? It's excitement. The pleasure you get in finding something new. A passage that nobody knew about before, or uh, a piece of rock that's just lovely to look at. Mm. And I understand that conservation has become a key issue as well. Yes, 48 caves in Britain are now known as places of special interest because of what they contain. And this is the same in other countries too. So do cavers enjoy competing like in other sports? No. We want to enjoy a safe sport. And in order to ensure that, there are no competitions in caving. We try to organise a range of events, but the emphasis is on cooperation and the enjoyment of the sport for what it can offer the individual. Well, it sounds like something I'll have to try one day. Mike, thank you very much for coming in and sharing. Now you'll hear part two again. In the studio with me today, I have Mike Reynolds, who's what is known as a caver. In other words, he spends long periods of time exploring underground caves for pleasure. And Mike's here to tell us all about this fascinating hobby and how to get started on it. So, Mike, why caves? Well... Cavers actually explore any space that's underground, whether it's caves, old mines or tunnels. Oh, right. So how big are these underground spaces? Oh, anything up to 80 kilometres long. Which means that in some cases, in order to reach the end, you've got to sleep, to set up camp inside the cave at some point, uh, usually where both space and fresh air are available. <laughs> no good if you're afraid of the dark. No. So where do you find the best caves? In terms of countries, the best places are, for example, Ireland, Australia and the Philippines. Here in the UK, various areas have the right sort of geology. Uh, my favourite is Wales, but you can find plenty of caves in northern England and in Scotland too. Mm. Caving involves a lot of physical exercise, doesn't it? That's right. In terms of physical activity, it's very similar to climbing, except they go up and we go down. <laughs> the conditions can be very different, though. We often find ourselves facing very small gaps in the rock, which we have to crawl through on our hands and knees. So the right equipment is obviously very important. If I wanted to start out on a hobby like this, what would I need? Well, you'd need a hard hat, and it's important to get one that fits properly, so that it doesn't keep falling over your eyes or feel too tight. And these can cost anything from 5 to £20. Pounds. Mm, that doesn't sound too much for starters. Oh, but then there's the lamp. You wear that in your head because it's very important to keep your hands free at all times. But it doesn't come with the hat, and it can cost anything up to £50 pounds to get a suitable one. Hmm. I guess warm clothes are a must too. You'll need to spend 30 to £40 pounds on a waterproof suit because the caves can be pretty wet and cold inside, and you can get ill if you're not protected. Then, of course, the thing that you really need to spend money on is something for your feet that keeps the water out. Strong boots are essential for this. Also, because without them, you could be slipping on wet surfaces and doing yourself an injury. Cheap ones are just not as safe, I'm afraid. Mm. Well, it sounds pretty tough. I mean, is it really only a sport for the young and fit? That's quite interesting, because people tend to think that. But, 
In fact, cavers come from all ages and backgrounds, students and professionals alike. You even find 80-year-olds who've been doing it for years. What exactly is it that people find so attractive? It's excitement. The pleasure you get in finding something new. A passage that nobody knew about before, or uh, a piece of rock that's just lovely to look at. Mm. And I understand that conservation has become a key issue as well. Yes, 48 caves in Britain are now known as places of special interest, because of what they contain. And this is the same in other countries too. So do cavers enjoy competing, like in other sports? No. We want to enjoy a safe sport, and in order to ensure that, there are no competitions in caving. We try to organise a range of events, but the emphasis is on cooperation and the enjoyment of the sport for what it can offer the individual. Well, it sounds like something I'll have to try one day. Mike, thank you very much for coming in and sharing. That's the end of part two. Now turn to part three. You'll hear five different people talking about their work on a cruise ship. For questions 19 to 23, Choose from the list, A to F, what each speaker says about their work. Use the letters only once. There is one extra letter which you do not need to use. You now have 30 seconds in which to look at part 3. Speaker 1. I deal with anything to do with entertainment on board, and that covers guest lecturers, cabaret artists, the show company, and any special nights. I have to plan each cruise with all the performers, and then introduce them at the beginning of the show. <laughs> There's never a dull moment. And if I want time to myself, I have to escape to my cabin, because a huge part of my job is to mix with people. There are often parties to attend, and then sometimes dance nights to organise. So, if I'm not in the shows, I'll be out there dancing with the passengers, because that's part of my job too. Speaker 2 I'm in charge of reception at the Health and Fitness Centre, so I greet passengers and organise their individual fitness programmes and beauty treatments. I wouldn't say it was glamorous because it's very hard work, but the rewards for me are meeting really interesting people and the system of working. We do eight-month contracts and once you've finished, it's up to you how much time you have off. Then you renew your contract when you're ready. I like working on a contract basis. I don't like to feel as if I'm stuck somewhere. At home, everyone follows the same nine-to-five pattern. Here, time just has a different meaning. Speaker 3. I'm responsible for the safety of the passengers. That means that apart from uh, keeping an eye on things on a day-to-day -day basis, I have to make sure that passengers can be safely evacuated if there's an emergency. So I do a lot of staff training to make sure each member of staff knows exactly what to do if there's a problem. And, of course, we do emergency drills with the passengers. In theory, I'm on call for 24 hours a day, but uh, in fact I'm generally on duty for about 15, so I do get the chance to socialise a bit too. Um, when we're in port, though, I get the whole time off. Speaker 4 There are six photographers here, and we take photos of passengers in various locations on the ship. My main role, though, is to develop and print all the passenger films, so I'm less in evidence socially. We don't have set hours because every cruise programme is different and because I print the photos, I frequently carry on working until six in the morning, getting them ready for the next day. It's quite exciting. People like having their pictures taken with the captain and we also do quite a few shots in the restaurant and on party nights, but generally people come to us with their own requests. 
Speaker 5. I'm in charge of all the restaurants on board, so menus, costings and the quality of food, plus any staff issues, it's all down to me. I love all that, even if the paperwork and accounts can be a bit dull sometimes. But I've worked for this company for nearly 24 years, and I haven't regretted it for one minute. Even though we can't choose where we go, we can put in requests for certain cruises. So normally I do four months away and then two months leave. <laughs> where else could you get a job like that and get paid for it? You miss your friends and family, but you don't get time to think about it. Now you'll hear part three again. Speaker one. I deal with anything to do with entertainment on board, and that covers guest lecturers, cabaret artists, the show company, and any special nights. I have to plan each cruise with all the performers and then introduce them at the beginning of the show. <laughs> There's never a dull moment, and if I want time to myself, I have to escape to my cabin because a huge part of my job is to mix with people. There are often parties to attend, and then sometimes dance nights to organise. So, if I'm not in the shows, I'll be out there dancing with the passengers, because that's part of my job too. Speaker 2 I'm in charge of reception at the Health and Fitness Centre, so I greet passengers and organise their individual fitness programmes and beauty treatments. I wouldn't say it was glamorous because it's very hard work, but the rewards for me are meeting really interesting people and the system of working. We do eight-month contracts and once you've finished, it's up to you how much time you have off. Then you renew your contract when you're ready. I like working on a contract basis. I don't like to feel as if I'm stuck somewhere. At home, everyone follows the same nine-to-five pattern. Here, time just has a different meaning. Speaker 3 I'm responsible for the safety of the passengers. That means that apart from uh, keeping an eye on things on a day-to-day -day basis, I have to make sure that passengers can be safely evacuated if there's an emergency. So I do a lot of staff training to make sure each member of staff knows exactly what to do if there's a problem. And, of course, we do emergency drills with the passengers. In theory, I'm on call for 24 hours a day, but uh, in fact I'm generally on duty for about 15, so I do get the chance to socialise a bit too. Um, when we're in port, though, I get the whole time off. Speaker 4 There are six photographers here, and we take photos of passengers in various locations on the ship. My main role, though, is to develop and print all the passenger films, so I'm less in evidence socially. We don't have set hours because every cruise programme is different and because I print the photos, I frequently carry on working until six in the morning, getting them ready for the next day. It's quite exciting. People like having their pictures taken with the captain and we also do quite a few shots in the restaurant and on party nights, but generally people come to us with their own requests. Speaker 5 I'm in charge of all the restaurants on board, so menus, costings and the quality of food, plus any staff issues, it's all down to me. I love all that, even if the paperwork and accounts can be a bit dull sometimes. But I've worked for this company for nearly 24 years, and I haven't regretted it for one minute. Even though we can't choose where we go, we can put in requests for certain cruises. So normally I do four months away and then two months leave. Where else could you get a job like that and get paid for it? You miss your friends and family, but you don't get time to think about it. That's the end of part three. Now turn to part four. You will hear an interview with a man called Stan Leach, who is talking about adventure sports. For questions 24 to 30, choose the best answer, A, B or C. 
You now have one minute in which to look at part four. Welcome back to the programme. Well, statistics show that the fastest growing sports in Britain are adventure sports. And I have with me Stan Leach, an official at the Sports Council, who's going to tell us a bit about some of them. Stan, where shall we start? Well, most people start with walking, I think. Although, of course, strictly speaking, it's not necessarily an adventure sport. But it's what gets most people outdoors. Indeed, the great thing about walking in Britain is the endless variety. From an easy stroll to a country pub to an energetic walk up a high peak. If you want to take up walking, you can start with a few short circular walks and then pick something longer and more demanding. What's this thing called scrambling I've been hearing about? Yeah, scrambling is sort of in the grey area between walking and climbing. Scrambles are graded according to difficulty, and on the harder ones, which are quite close to rock climbing, it's best to go with an expert. Well, that brings us nicely on to climbing. That's really caught on here lately, hasn't it? Yes, and of course, you know it doesn't have to mean going up the really big ones like Everest. Climbing might seem rather terrifying to begin with, but it's great fun and really keeps you fit. You start by climbing small crags, before moving on to a rock face. I went for a day's lesson with mountaineer Alan Kimber in Scotland, and it was really scary, but really exciting. Right. Well, what's next? Mountain biking. If you can get used to the saddle, you can cycle across Britain. But unlike in the USA, where there are special cycling paths, in Britain, most of the paths are the same as for walkers, which can cause a bit of trouble. After the initial investment, there's one bike that costs £4,000, <laughs> but you can get a very good one for £200. It's a cost-efficient sport, and there are relatively easy trips, such as the Pyrenees Traverse, which has 70% downhill slopes with no major climbs. Scuba diving's my personal favourite. Any advice on that? Yes. Swimming underwater opens up a whole new world. Actually, for most people, the idea of being underwater, unable to breathe normally, is a frightening one. But with good tuition, you can pick it up in no time at all. Once you get the qualification you need to be considered a competent diver, you can do it anywhere. I see you've got skydiving on your list. Surely that's only for people who are very brave or mad. <laughs> well, it is the sort of thing you'd expect to only see in the movies. But you'd be amazed how many people go in for it these days. Six hours of training will give you enough background to make the first jump. People who really take to it often join display teams. So if you take it up, you might find yourself taking part in special events. OK. And finally, canoeing. That always looks a bit dangerous to me, in that tiny boat with water rushing everywhere. Well, there are some terrible bits of water where the real canoeing experts go. But beginners can start in gentler waters and build up. There's one stretch in Wales that was designed for the World Championships that has a dam release, so that at preset times the water runs through. You can phone up and they'll say it's a full release tomorrow, or a quarter release, so you can choose your times according to difficulty. OK, Stan, thanks a lot. After the break, we'll be going to Canada to look... Now you'll hear part four again.
Welcome back to the program. Well, statistics show that the fastest growing sports in Britain are adventure sports. And I have with me Stan Leach, an official at the Sports Council, who's going to tell us a bit about some of them. Stan, where shall we start? Well, most people start with walking, I think. Although, of course, strictly speaking, it's not necessarily an adventure sport. But it's what gets most people outdoors. Indeed, the great thing about walking in Britain is the endless variety. From an easy stroll to a country pub to an energetic walk up a high peak. If you want to take up walking, you can start with a few short circular walks and then pick something longer and more demanding. What's this thing called scrambling I've been hearing about? Yeah, scrambling is sort of in the grey area between walking and climbing. Scrambles are graded according to difficulty, and on the harder ones, which are quite close to rock climbing, it's best to go with an expert. Well, that brings us nicely on to climbing. That's really caught on here lately, hasn't it? Yes, and of course, you know it doesn't have to mean going up the really big ones like Everest. Climbing might seem rather terrifying to begin with, but it's great fun and really keeps you fit. You start by climbing small crags before moving on to a rock face. I went for a day's lesson with mountaineer Alan Kimber in Scotland, and it was really scary but really exciting. Right. Well, what's next? Mountain biking. If you can get used to the saddle, you can cycle across Britain. But unlike in the USA, where there are special cycling paths, in Britain, most of the paths are the same as for walkers, which can cause a bit of trouble. After the initial investment, there's one bike that costs £4,000, <laughs> but you can get a very good one for £200. It's a cost-efficient sport, and there are relatively easy trips, such as the Pyrenees Traverse, which has 70% downhill slopes with no major climbs. Scuba diving's my personal favourite. Any advice on that? Yes. Swimming underwater opens up a whole new world. Actually, for most people, the idea of being underwater, unable to breathe normally, is a frightening one. But with good tuition, you can pick it up in no time at all. Once you get the qualification you need to be considered a competent diver, you can do it anywhere. I see you've got skydiving on your list. Surely that's only for people who are very brave or mad. <laughs> well, it is the sort of thing you'd expect to only see in the movies. But you'd be amazed how many people go in for it these days. Six hours of training will give you enough background to make the first jump. People who really take to it often join display teams. So if you take it up, you might find yourself taking part in special events. OK. And finally, canoeing. That always looks a bit dangerous to me, in that tiny boat with water rushing everywhere. Well, there are some terrible bits of water where the real canoeing experts go, but beginners can start in gentler waters and build up. There's one stretch in Wales that was designed for the World Championships that has a dam release, so that at preset times the water runs through. You can phone up and they'll say it's a full release tomorrow, or a quarter release, so you can choose your times according to difficulty. OK, Stan, thanks a lot. After the break, we'll be going to Canada to look... That is the end of part four. There will now be a pause of five minutes for you to copy your answers onto the separate answer sheet. Be sure to follow the numbering of all the questions. I shall remind you when there is one minute left so that you are sure to finish in time. That is the end of the test. Please stop now. Your supervisor will now collect all the question papers and answer sheets.